In 2010, there was an architectural competition held in New York City's Union Square to redesign the sukkah. All the halakhic requirements had to be met. It had to have at least two and a half walls. It had to be at least 10 handbreadths high. You had to be able to see the stars through the roof. And they had to be made of at least some natural materials. But other than that, you could make anything. The entrance pushed the boundaries of what we think of as a sukkah with breathtaking creations. But there was one sukkah that stood out amongst the rest. It was perhaps less beautiful, but more powerful. This was called the sukkah of the signs, and this is what the artist had to say about it. One of the most interesting rules to us was the notion of something that grew from the ground, uh, but no longer is connected to the ground. Cardboard is made from the ground materials of hardwoods that's basically pulverized into a pulp and reconstituted and uh, made into paper. And cor corrugated board is basically paper, but the difference is, is that it has a corrugation in it that allows for it to be much stronger and much more durable. That's what inspired this notion of the corrugated board homeless sign. And of course, knowing that the sukkah itself commemorates the 40 years of wandering during Exodus, and we said, well, perfect, this makes a perfect match between contemporary wandering and temporary homelessness and uh, traditional or ancient historical biblical ideas. However, one of the inspirations much earlier than the homeless signs that we had was actually a Muslim mosque that we happened upon in Yemen in a Somalian refugee camp that was entirely made of corrugated board and the villagers wanted us to see their most important building and they took us to their mosque. And the mosque was one of the most beautiful structures that we've ever seen uh, because of the quality of light that was coming through the handles of the cardboard holes that were cut out. Once we won the competition, we realized we had a lot of signs to collect. We collected signs from San Francisco, San Diego, Oakland, Los Angeles, Las Vegas, and Denver. We would start to locate places where people signed, mostly highway uh, off-ramps and bridge underpasses. And, and we would approach them, and in the beginning, we would explain to them the project we were working on, introduce ourselves, and ask them if they would be willing to sell their sign. And that was really important to us, the fact that we were able to make an exchange for the sign, because we felt like, in some ways, we were contributing to their cause in a very direct way through the competition. They were very grateful, but they'd often say, now I can go get something to eat. So we understood the meaning of the purchase of the sign. The sukkah of the signs linked the historical idea of wandering to the modern concept of homelessness. A fragile home built on the disposable signs of people who are too often seen as disposable. When you think about it, the timing of Sukkot is strange. Why is it that only a few days after the spiritual highs of Yom Kippur do we depart our homes for the shaky huts of Sukkot? Sure, the holiday coincides with the harvest season in ancient Israel, but there is something more than that. The proximity of the days of awe and the days of outdoor dwelling are meant to teach us something. Sukkot is a commentary on Yom Kippur. When Ne'ilah rolls around and we have spent 10 days and 25 intense hours praying our way into God's good graces, we have atoned, we have apologized, we have heeded the call of the shofar, and we might think that we are good with God. But according to the tradition, one should start constructing the frame of their sukkah at the conclusion of Yom Kippur even before you eat lest we think that this sense that we now dwell in God's house is permanent. When you have heard the final shofar blast and extinguished the great and terrifying torch that was the Havdalah candle this year, at that very moment, the next thing that you should do is begin to assemble your makeshift sukkah. At any, uh, any certainty that you had that your prayers had been heard before the gates closed is tempered by the sight of that temporary structure. 
The sukkah must, by its very nature, be ephemeral, temporary, shaky, a reminder that nothing lasts. Not this good weather, not your good fortune, not even your life. Rabbi Alan Liu says that this comes to teach us something about the spiritual state we exist in, not just on Sukkot, but always. He writes that the sukkah exposes the idea of a house as an illusion. The idea of a house is that it gives us security and shelter, haven from the storm, but no house can really offer us this. No building of wood or stone can ever afford us protection from the disorder that is always lurking around us. If the words of Una Tana Tokef on Yom Kippur are about reminding us that life is fragile, then the whole holiday of Sukkot quite literally brings this message home. The Mishnah, in describing the fulfillment of the commandment of Sukkot, says something strange. For seven complete days, a person should make their sukkah into a permanent keva residence and their house into a temporary arai residence. Dwelling in the sukkah actually changes our understanding of our permanent houses. What we once understood to be permanent, we now know to be temporary. There is something equalizing about the sukkah. You might make it with fancy comfy couches or hip wall hangings or dangling succulents in glass globes. You can dress it up, but at the end of the day, it is still a shack. As Samson Raphael Hirsch writes, Whatever may be your station in life, whether you are rich or richly or poorly endowed with goods of this world, you are neither dazzled by abundance nor frightened by want. The goods of the earth are not your goods. It is with that with which others reject and despise that you build this tabernacle of your life. You know that, when, that whether man lives in huts or in palaces, it is only as pilgrims that they dwell. Both huts and palaces form only our transitory home. We may, in the quality of our possessions, be divided into a thousand grades. One may build his walls of hewn stone and others of modest planks. But in respect to our actual protection of that which covers and shields us, the skach, the roofing, we are all equal. In the walls we may differ, but in the skach we are equal. And in understanding this fundamental equality, we come to know something of the lives of those who have less, for whom the impermanence of home is not a metaphor, but a lived reality. The Torah commands that we must share our holiday with the stranger, the orphan, and the widow. Maimonides elaborates that the joy of Sukkot is sharing it with others, those you love, but also those less fortunate than you. To fail to share your good fortune with the stranger and the downtrodden and enjoy only filling your stomach, Rambam says, is a disgrace. Sukkot is an act of radical empathy. For seven days we are required to be homeless. We are not done until our temporary home feels permanent so that we understand that our permanent home is temporary. And we must then translate that empathy into action, into compassion for those who suffer that does not lead us to pity, but rather to the fight for justice. This may shock you to learn, but there is no biblical concept of homelessness. The rabbis don't discuss the issue. For a people whose story is so fundamentally based in wandering, it is surprising to discover that homelessness just does not exist in early Jewish texts. Poverty exists, but poverty was something that the rabbis understood to be temporary, the result of a bad crop yield or a business deal gone sideways. The idea that poverty might mean the loss of a safe place to live, the idea of chronic homelessness, the idea of generational poverty would be as incomprehensible to the biblical author as, or the rabbinic imagination as cell phones or autonomous vehicles. For example, in Maimonides' Mishnah Torah, he says that if a person is poor but owns their property and household utensils, even if those utensils are made of gold and silver, they should not be required to sell these things before they can access the community tzedakah funds. So unfathomable is the idea that one might lose their house due to poverty that the text does not even consider it. Rather, Rambam states that if you are having a tough time, the community supports you and you don't have to sell off your future. 
The community makes sure that you can get back on your feet so that next season or next year you can get back to your life. Poverty is a communal responsibility. You take care of your neighbor who is destitute in part because at the next harvest, it might be you. This is the humanizing project of Sukkot, a reminder to care for the vulnerable because someday the vulnerable will be us. We have all learned something powerful about the necessity and vulnerability of home this year. As we have all sheltered at home, as we have turned our houses into fortresses against the pandemic, have we also held an awareness of the many people who have no stable home to fortify? As we fought last spring to keep schools closed so that our children could learn safely from home, were we also thinking about the 30 million American children who need to go to school because it's the only place where they are fed? During the pandemic, safe, reliable housing is health care, and those who don't have access to it are much, much more vulnerable. And at the same time, more people in our community are suffering. More and more of our neighbors are hanging way too close to the edge of poverty, and many have fallen over it. A Kinder Institute study from before the pandemic found that four in 10 Houston families didn't have the money to cover a $400 emergency expense. What the government gave, when the government gave out $15 million in rental assistance this year, it was claimed within three days. I'm told by Tao Costas, president and CEO of Search, that Houston's eviction moratorium has made a difference to keep people safe. But it is only a moratorium. If you don't have the money to pay your bills, those bills are stacking up. A massive eviction crisis is looming, and many people are self-evicting, leaving their more stable residences to avoid having an eviction on their record. Those people are much more likely to end up in situations that are tenuous and difficult. Tao, who we will have the honor of learning from on Tuesday night, told me that while the folks at Search have yet to see a huge influx of people experiencing homelessness, they have seen a steady rise, and many of the people they are seeing are not their regular clientele, but folks experiencing homelessness for the very first time. This Sukkot, like the Sukkot after Harvey, we don't need our huts to teach us about instability or insecurity. We know that state all too well. And we are called to turn that understanding out onto the world as empathy, to let it shape how we treat those who experience homelessness, those who experience housing insecurity. Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik comments on the book of Job. Job complains to God about his misfortune, saying, Did I not feed the hungry and give charity to the needy? And God responds, As a man blessed with a good heart, you may have momentarily pitied the orphan. You had vast amounts of money and you wanted for nothing. Hence, you gave a respectable amount of tzedakah. However, loving kindness demands more than a momentary tear or a cold coin. Loving kindness means empathizing with one's fellow man, identifying with his hurt and feeling responsibility for his fate. The holiday of Sukkot asks us to do more than just feed those who are hungry. We must see their humanity reflected in our own and defend them against anyone who might see them as disposable. The Talmud tells the story of a debate between Rabbi Akiva and the Roman governor, Turnus Rufus. The governor asks, if your God loves the poor, why does God not support them? Akiva replies, so that we may be saved from, through them, from punishment. On the contrary, Turnus Rufus says, it is this which condemns you. I will illustrate this by a parable. Suppose an earthly king was angry with his servant and put him in prison and ordered that he should not be given food or drink, and a man went and gave him food or drink. If the king heard, would would he not be angry with him? Is the existence of poverty in this world not a sign that God has lost faith in you? Rabbi Akiva responded to him, I will illustrate by another parable. Suppose an earthly king was angry with his son, and he put him in prison and ordered that no food or drink should be given to him, and someone went and gave him food and drink. If the king heard of it, would he not reward this person? We are all the children of God, the housed and the unhoused, the stable and the insecure, the privileged and the impoverished. God's love is not measured in how much we suffer or how much we struggle. God's love is measured in how much we help each other when we stumble. This year, as we dwell in the instable houses of our Sukkot, 
May we think of the sukkah of signs, that sukkah built out of the cardboard signs purchased from people who dwell on the street. May we see all around us the signs of the humanity of our neighbors, of the people who live in our community, whether they have homes or not. May these temporary dwellings awaken our empathy and inspire our action in this new year, and may all who long for home find it. King Yehi Ratzon, may we make God's will a reality. Shabbat Shalom.